All right, so I'm Bruce Saratani, and uh, my partner here, Wayne Wheelis. We're going to talk about uh, cyber analytics and how to be more effective at that. And we'll get into that in a second. I'd like to introduce ourselves a little better, though. I'm actually 20 years in the Air Force. I know I don't look old enough to have that. I actually have a three-year-old granddaughter who is delightful and charming. Just ask her. She'll tell you. So I've been in the Air Force for 20 years, and then for the last 10 years, I worked on big data projects. And then went to AOL, worked on big data projects, and came to IBM after, after 10 years at AOL, and I've been here for five years to work on big data projects, which means I got five more years to find a job. So if anybody's interested in five years, give me a call. So the big data challenge, though, is related to cyber directly. We talk about cyber a lot, but what you hear today is a lot about the messaging around big data and how that can give you insight into your cyber challenges. And then more importantly, how do we leverage it all together as a single pane of glass? What if you had all the information that knows what's going on, how about the impact it is, and then be able to do something about it from one pane of glass? That's what we're attempting to do today. So I'm going to do a few slides to introduce the topic, and then Wayne's going to come up and uh, talk about the real stuff. He's actually the subject matter expert. He's the brains of the team. I'm the charming, good-looking guy. No, don't laugh at all. <laughs> all right. Just ask me. Uh, I don't own a tie because I'm a solutions architect by trade, right? I don't do sales. I do pre-sales work, business development, helping identify opportunities, and seeing if the tools in our toolbox from IBM will help you, right? So I'm trying to find out from all of you all what your cyber challenges are and to see how we can help fit that. And this, this actual project was related directly to that based on the need. So for example, the most common attacks we see today are actually from malware and DDoS. Uh, but quite frankly, there's a lot of undisclosed attacks. We're not sure what those cyber attacks are. if They're not told to us by the industry. And you can see that by computer services and retail are the biggest attack points. Medical, though, and healthcare are way up there as well in media. So this is just a direct kind of you know, who's getting attacked. I think the most interesting slide that I have to talk about is this one. If you can digest those two things, this is 2014, 2015 information. The outsiders, although they have the greatest impact and, the, and actually have the most damage to your system, in 2014, it was 45% of the attacks came from outside. In 2015, it was 40%. That means 60% of the attacks on your system came from people who you quote unquote trusted, people who had access to your environment. So the insider threat, although not as dangerous maybe, is more prolific, right? whether it's intentional or unintentional. And I was surprised by that statistic. Uh, it's, it's important to look inside your systems as well as outside. So just defending the perimeter isn't going to get the job done. So I'm going to introduce uh, Wayne. Again, this is a subject matter expert. Wayne's got some terrible stories to tell you. If you don't get scared by the end of today's discussion, uh, you need to check your pulse. <laughs> hey, thanks, Bruce. So good afternoon. Hopefully we can uh, turn up the energy level. Uh, anytime you have to present afternoon, it's, it's a little rough. OK, hopefully everybody had a good morning. Um, my name is Wayne Wheelis. I'm the CEO and founder of Release2 Innovation. Uh, we're a small firm working primarily in like network forensics and a variety of different uh, services that we deliver to our customers. I have worked in cyber and network forensics for roughly uh, just over a decade. Okay. With R2I, I put together an all-star team that some people are familiar <coughs> with some of the stuff we've done. Right now, we are delivering uh, analytic solutions in cyber for two of the largest nonprofit healthcare systems in the US, and one of the Fortune 50, as well as the Department of Homeland Security. Okay? Uh, my background, very impressive. My picture, not as impressive. We are in the process of remediating that right now. <laughs> Exposure, this is where it all starts. Um, when we, earlier this afternoon, I had a discussion with someone about exposure coming in and talking to customers and introducing them to what does the attack surface of your, your network look like or your organization? And you go in and you start talking to customers about what is your exposure, as in what can be accessed, what can be seen, what, you know, how much of the iceberg is above water? 
And this is always an interesting discussion because it's always, uh, I had a customer last week that I sat down with and uh, we were talking about exposure. And it was like, I want you to take a look at my network and I want you to tell me what my exposure is in 24 hours. I want you to come back, scan it, summarize it, and tell me what you find. When we came back and we showed him what he found, it was beautiful, my favorite quote, that can't be. So um, it is an eye opener to see what is exposed out on the internet, and what's accessible. To that point, because I always, always, especially after lunch, like to show people something worth writing home about. So what we did, knowing that today we'd be here at the beautiful Willard. Oh, we do love our devices. We live in a device heavy environment. What we did was we went out and did an analysis of the exposure based on this as the center point going out 20 miles. We found several hundred thousand devices that we could interact with very easily. Uh, 175 FTP servers that we could log into unchallenged, default user ID and password. Some of the FTP servers don't even have a challenge, so they're not even user ID password. Uh, SQL Server, we found about 200 databases that were sitting out there that we could pull data down if we really wanted to. Um, looking and surveying the headers, we could look at the different operating systems that were available. Roughly 1% of the operating systems within 20 miles of where I'm standing right here are up to date and patched. And that is what our adversaries, like our friend Guccifer that you saw on uh, the news this morning, that's what they're banking on. That's absolutely what they're banking. And their calculus is almost always right because the IT department's gonna take nine months to roll it out, nothing against my friends in IT. But as we roll that out slowly, that's exposure, okay? Um, we actually, interestingly enough, found one medical facility in DC that we could log into um, their central desk with uh, just a default user ID and password. Okay, just defaults. And that's a medical center here in DC. So if we go out uh, 10 miles, I'll talk a little bit today about SCADA devices. You'll hear about SCADA devices. I wanna show you what a SCADA device is, okay? When you're talking about things like gas pumps, gas stations, we use them all the time. We're intimately familiar with them. They have an infrastructure within 10 miles of where I'm standing right now, we can access the pumps in the fuel management system for 15 different gas stations. Here, I'll actually show you a screenshot from one of them. At the same time, we found 1,014 devices, medical devices, dental offices, legal offices, fitness centers, government agencies that were wide open that we could just punch into pretty much at will. And that is a, a, a significant part of the challenge right there is when you're dealing with organizations, they don't know what is visible from the outside. Okay. So I want to bring this in today and, and kind of let people get a look at it. Um, everybody's always like, that can't be. That's what I heard from this guy last week. So I always like to bring <clears throat> a little thing called proof of life. Okay. So this is proof of life right here. If you look up here at the top, this is a gas station fuel monitoring system right here. You can recognize regular plus and supreme gas. You can see how many gallons they've got sitting in the tank. That's their fuel management system. It's exposed on the internet. 15 of those directly accessible, lightly defended. Okay. Down at the bottom, this is just from an external facing organization. We can actually access desktops within many of the organizations here in the DC metro area. Um, I know you VPN into your organization a lot of the time. Sometimes the IT department or, you know, some part of the organization will make certain machines accessible outside. That leads to this. Hundreds of devices that are accessible from outside your, you know, your fortress that you've set up, your security, to Bruce's point about perimeter defense. There, uh, it's, it's now there is no front line. The front line is everywhere. Every machine has to defend itself, okay? So this is kind of what you're dealing with. If you look at it, we've had two major, over here on the right, we've had two major attacks on critical infrastructure for years, for years. I sat on panel discussions and I wrote papers and they had told me the power grid couldn't be touched. 
that it just won't happen. It's not possible, it's not likely, it's not probable. Well, ask Ukraine and ask Israel, okay? Because these two attacks over here demonstrate to you what can be done to the power grid in a single shot. DOD, I think we've all heard uh, a lot about that one. Insider threat, is, as Bruce had pointed out, is a growing, growing problem. If you look at some of the recent high-profile breaches, often, more often than not, you're dealing with the insider threat component or an inadvertent insider threat component. So I'm not, I won't get into the specifics about who the actors are, but there have been instances where um, USB devices, lightweight USB devices, are left at like Starbucks and some of these other facilities. The, the hackers will actually go in, or the attackers will actually go in and leave 10 or 15 of these behind in like a Starbucks or some kind of coffee house or something. And people pick them up and they take them to work and then they use them and they're malware infected. They inadvertently have now launched an insider threat attack against their own network. When they plug those in, those open holes in the security of that network. Okay? So that's a fun fact. And then over on the left, PII, personally identifying information. There is a trade like you cannot imagine for um, medical information. You would say, why would anybody want to steal your medical records? It converts very easily into passports. I mean, I can generate a passport by using your medical information. Your driver's license just doesn't have enough information. So those are actually currency on the dark web that you'll see. So one of the points that I always try to drive home with people, because there is this perception from roughly uh, back in like the phone freaking days, back in the 70s, and your, um, your Wozniak types, and even your Mitnick types about phone freaking and stuff like that. And everybody still has that perception, that mindset, that it's just a couple of people sitting in their basement, you know, playing with their laptop. It's not like that. This is a business. This is a snapshot of 14 days, two weeks of data of the criminal infrastructure on the internet. And if you look at it, you can see up at the top what the criminal activity is. That big block over there on the left is, is Zeus, the Zeus infrastructure. And if you look down on the bottom, you can actually see the density in the different networks. That's actually the, the first octet down there in that bottom set of blocks. You'll hear a lot of people say with natting, you know, with natting and the way the internet works, you really can't understand where the attackers are coming from or how they're doing things or anything else. I, I would politely and respectfully disagree. If you trend that over time, you can actually start to find very high concentrations of criminal activity in certain networks across the world. Okay? And when we come in with clients, a lot of the time we will give them 200 networks right off the bat that these are ones you really need to ensure never traverse your network. Okay. So the challenge that we're dealing with these days is talking to customers, there's a lot of, um, in IT, when you're dealing with the IT department, a lot of the time there's always, yeah, I, I need to buy a product to deal with that problem. Yeah, I need to buy a product to deal with it. You know what I mean? It's a rat pellet. I just get this, get this, get this. You know, if I'm, I'm just one purchase away from Nirvana all the time. If you go in and talk to the IT department, it's a lot of the time, that's how they think about it. And they think about cyber as kind of an extension of the traditional IT field, and it's, it's really not. Um, you'll see, you know, if you go into each one of the big, uh, the organizations that have been victimized, and targeted by some of these major data breaches that you've seen. All of the big vendors, I, I think uh, especially with like Target, Home Depot, and some of those, if you look at it, all the big vendors were there. They were all there. Um, all the big names. But they were all piece, piecemeal solutions. It wasn't integrated. It wasn't a seamless picture of this. This is situational awareness. No, it was showing you what's going on over in one part of the network and not showing you total situational awareness. Um, jargon and processes associated with tools. A lot of the time, if you bring in a new tool, you have to change and re, uh, recalibrate all your processes and re-engineer them. And that kind of leads to uh, chaos within the defensive infrastructure. Um, 
when we come in right now and we provide support for our clients, I can't just walk in and say, okay, take all the stuff you've got right now and get rid of it. It's not as simple as just an investment. They didn't just buy a bunch of disparate parts. The problem is their processes are all built around those components. So you, when you come in, you have to harmonize and balance yourself with everything else in the ecosystem. You can't be, I mean, disruptive is a good thing in certain spaces. Disruptive in cyber, when you're coming in trying to help an organization deal with ransomware, not so good. The ability to sense make. If I were to look at the organizations, I wrote one of the postmortems on Target. And if you go in and you look at the organization, one of the biggest things from the IT guys to the security people, all the way up to leadership was there wasn't the ability to make sense of everything, pull it all together into one spot, present it in front of me in an intuitive manner, and then most of all, be prescriptive. What do you want me to do? That has been lacking in so many of these, these areas. Um, and then finally, uh, the cyber professional. Every time when I drive around the Beltway, I'm always comforted when I hear that we're gonna graduate 9,000 cyber graduates this year who are gonna sit the desk for two years before they're competent, before they're considered able to run the desk. We're not scaling to keep up with the challenge. If you look at the number of devices that are coming online, if you look at the amount of data that's being generated, and you look at the number of cyber graduates that are coming out of school, we're not keeping up. Okay. So we can't necessarily just grow our way out of it. So first of all, always for project managers, project managers are people I have to keep, uh, keep, keep happy. Uh, for any of you who are unfamiliar, we actually do have a calendar, which is cyberdespair.com, which is, um, if you've ever seen despair.com, it's, it's an ugly alter ego for cyber. The first thing we have to keep in mind when we're talking about a defensive infrastructure is we have to deliver high quality results. We have to be cognizant and responsible about costs. We can't just come in and say, you know, spend all your money on this and this will take care of everything. So we have to ensure that what we're delivering is quality. We have to always be cognizant of the cost and then measurable results. If you look at the commercial customers we work with right now, our block ratios are reported. Our reportable events are reported all the way up to the C-suite. So they see that stuff. They're not looking at, you know, well, the nerds are sitting in the closet dealing with that problem. Definitely not the case. They see all of the metrics we're providing. Okay. So they know and they can kind of gauge the effectiveness of what we're doing. Monitor fatigue. So I went into an organization roughly four months ago and I had them walk me through, okay, this is an... Um, you're being uh, uh, hit by this particular actor right now. Can you walk me through how you're gonna, how you're gonna triage that, how you're gonna make a decision, and then what you're gonna do from that? 13 different systems. They use 13 different systems to look up an IP address. That's, that's maddening. I mean, really, you know, when you look at the number of IP addresses that are going across the network and the number of threats that you have to deal with on a daily basis, 13 different systems just to look up one IP address to make some evaluation of, yeah, that's bad. So what we really need to drive for is a single pane of glass. We're actually gonna show you fish fry this afternoon, which is something we have in production in two of the largest healthcare networks in the United States fighting off ransomware. And it is actually this desired state, which is a single pane of glass that tells you what is going on and what to do about it. And then Bruce picks up. Yes, Hans. So, is anybody scared yet? No? Okay. So, it's after lunch, man. It's, <laughs> it's after right. lunch. So, there's a process that goes with this, right? We're talking about identifying the threat, which we have systems that are really good at. Right? If you made an investment in this, the solution we're talking about takes advantage of that data, advantage of those systems, right? But I want to also figure out if I find something, what do I do about it? Let's remediate the problem. Can you imagine going to a doctor with a fever and then a doctor confirming, yeah, you've got a fever, you're sick. I'd really like to get healthy again. Can you give me something to take care of that, right? A prescription. That's what this is all about, is what do I do to fix the problem I have, that remediation step. Right? And then investigate. You know, the first time, so I've got granddaughter, I said earlier, a three-year-old at home. When she comes home and she's got that cough, 
she's sick, and I know what's going to happen next, right? The rest of the house is going to get sick. But she's not patient zero, right? Somebody at her daycare center was sick already. This is that whole point. When you finally get infected, guess what? It's probably not the first time your system's been infected by that same virus. If you can investigate who went to that link before, where that network connection was done before, and see where the impact is, and how many other systems, although haven't showed symptoms yet, are sick. What's your real vulnerability? What's the impact that's going on? The solutions we're talking about allow you to do that investigation. And then defend yourself better, right? So we know what to look for. We have solutions that say, here's a signature, here's a particular virus. We know how to protect against the things that look just like this. But what if you could protect against the variants, the things that are slightly different, different enough that they get through your defenses, right? It looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, walks like a duck. Well, let me, let me identify that to you and then start looking at that as an interesting item. There's a major challenge with that. It's called false positives. I don't want to give you 100, 200 things that look interesting because then only one or two things are interesting in that pile. What I want to do is show you the five or 10 things that are interesting and the two of those things that are actually a problem, right? So with the vast volume of data we have historically, we can minimize the false positives so the things that we find interesting for you to look at really are interesting to look at. Right. So specifically in this kind of architecture, we have today, most systems will have a real-time monitoring system, right? But what they don't typically have is endpoint management. We said earlier about all these things that have default passwords, all these configurations that are out of date, they're on the wrong version of software. There's we know there's vulnerabilities. Endpoint management, which we provide in the solution, will tell you which of those systems are at risk and need to be defended or upgraded. We can also tell you that, you know what, the CFO and the CTO systems are out of date, which is probably a priority versus the administrator for leave and vacation time. So we can prioritize what needs to get fixed as well and identify the shortcomings. And then while this data is coming in in real time, we want to feed it to a big data analytics environment, some massive parallel processing that can look at all the data and look for those things that look like a duck, sound like a duck, quack like a duck. So you can defend against those as well. And as I mentioned earlier, when you do get infected from a real time virus that got through, know what the impact is and research and see who went to that location, who clicked on that URL, everything else. Because that data is available and with big data analytics, you can look at all the data. Historically, it's been overwhelming. It's been too much. But now it's possible to take a look and see what's been going on in your organization for the last, not day or week or month, but for the last years, and figure out exactly what's going on. And by the way, CFOs and CTOs tend to be click happy, for lack of a better phrase. They get a URL and an email, and they click on it, and it says, to see this document, you need to click on these macros. Do you want to allow macros? Yes, boom, all right? They're, they're more interested in getting their work done than the security side of things. Even though they're trained not to do it, unless you electrify that seat, I'm not sure how that's gonna change, right? They click, they're click happy people, and to defend against that uh, is a really hard thing. So again, finding out which systems are out of date and, and need to be protected are the, really usually the more critical systems to worry about. Right, and Wayne's got uh, some other good news. Cool, yes, yes. Okay, now we get into the fun stuff. So uh, I'm sure that all of us lately have heard about ransomware in the news. It's, uh, you're hearing a lot of it. The hospital that got hit out on the West Coast um, was one of the first experiences we had had with Locky. Locky is a new, uh, a next generation piece of ransomware. Interesting about Locky, uh, Locky is actually being distributed by the developer. It is not being distributed. So a lot of the time, the people who develop these things, like Locky, Locky is a piece of ransomware. Usually it's delivered to you, you open a Word document, it'll give the appearance of being gibberish, and it'll say, go ahead and enable macros, and uh, you'll be able to see the document correctly. When they enable uh, the macros, it uh, encrypts probably a quarter of their drive, gets all the good stuff, all the exec cell files, the PowerPoint, the Word documents. Um, it encrypts them. And then it uh, tells you, you have three days to pay them a ransom over Tor, uh, accessing the Tor network, um, or they'll delete the key. And when they delete the key, you're, 
your SOL. I mean, you're, they're going to have to recreate your machine. They're going to have to re-image it. Um, Locky is actually being sold by the developers. That is a very different model. Usually, they will develop malware. They'll sell it to an arms dealer, and the arms dealer will be selling that out on dark web. You'll see, you know, you can actually buy a lot of these. Actually, when Locky first came out, we bought a copy of it within 24 hours so that we could give it to incident responders to give them experience firsthand in dealing with it. So we set up some virtual machines and actually had Locky ransom, you know, have the ransomware installed so that the first responders, the incident responders get a chance to deal with it before machines are being infected on their network. If you want a custom variant, and right now I think we're on the fourth iteration, the fourth release of Locky. It keeps changing. When it first came out, 54 of the most common antivirus software uh, suites available, only four identified Locky right off the bat, four. Uh, and th that's a really bad number. When you look across the globe at how much money they were able to, to obtain from this and the fact that they keep changing it over and over again, it's very hard to keep pace. You can get a custom variant of it for roughly seven to eight K. Um, you can order your own version. Okay. And they'll actually make it where it can defeat different types of um, uh, antivirus suites and things of that nature. It's got a really nice upgrade package with it. So if we were to use this end-to-end -end solution we're talking about today, how could that have worked differently? So I've, I've worked with this, uh, the IBM solution on some of the largest um, implementations uh, there are, I mean, across the, both the federal and the commercial space. Pure data has been the cornerstone because pure data, I mean, a lot of people, and, and I'm sure I'd get the question here, why would you use a pure data? A pure data is a beast. Um, 750 billion events a day processed, 200 concurrent users on the system as I'm processing that. It is a beast. It'll, it enables us to pull in all the disparate types of data. We enrich it. We pull it in with the pure data. And the pure data versus the Natiza, the pure data is 27 times faster. I know that because I just got out of the testing. Um, based on that, we provide views to the security operations team, uh, the net ops team, and then also analytic results for uh, different, different background jobs that they're running, looking for phishing. Uh, ransomware, things of that nature. Over on the right, you can start to see some of the different data sets that we have in here. One of the most interesting things that I would add, I would point out to you today, is known networks. Known networks is in production in three places. Known networks has delivered 35 to 50 percent reductions in false positives or non actionable events. And I mean, that's a game changer. When you sit the desk and you have to deal with this stuff on a daily basis, 35 to 50%, you start to scale, okay? So what we're doing is we're using pure data. Pure data is basically the engine sitting in the center of everything. We're pulling all of this data in, and then we're correlating. And by time, we can show what's happening in the firewall logs, what's happening in the net flow, what's happening with the signature-based systems, um, any of the web logs. We can correlate all of that on time, and we can give you one pane of glass about everything going on across the enterprise in one line. So we add in all the enrichment over here. We run the analytics on top of it, and I'm going to show you fish fry here in a minute. And then we have the other elements of the suite, as in Q radar, uh, big fix to go out and, and fix things, and then Cognos, which is driving the visualization. This is fish fry. Fish fry is actually in production in two of the largest healthcare networks in the U.S. It's in their sock. This is actually a desktop view. It's, it's, uh, this is two versions old. This is a desktop view. They also have a sock view that will show them. If you look up at the top, starting up at the top, you'll see all of the malicious email that's coming in. This actually identifies and runs a series of analytics. You can see over here that things are being flagged as like suspicious or potentially malicious. As things are coming in, we're processing all the metadata and then whoever's the analyst can actually click on one of these and it'll show them what machines were being targeted on their network. Did any IDS signatures fire with that? They fish all day, but a lot of the time you'll delete them. But if I see a signature go off, I know somebody clicked on the payload. 
and it's been downloaded to them. So this is correlating phishing with NetFlow down here on the bottom. Did you interact with a malicious entity? Signatures, did you reach out to the bad actor that tried to drop something on your computer? And then vulnerabilities associated with cyber hygiene. Increasingly, customers are incorporating uh, their cyber hygiene data. What is the, the patch level associated with that machine? In the case of like medical devices, a lot of the time they can't patch those. So you'll actually see all the different vulnerabilities associated with that machine stream out. And then down on the bottom, you actually see here where it's making recommendations of what to do. Okay? In the event that this happens, we're actually dealing with um, a potential exploit on, on Chrome. This is the specific exploit that they're trying to reach out to, and this is the fix to that. So that, serving as an analyst in the SOC, that's what I would see. But I'd have to call like the local network team and have them take a look. So calling them, they would pull up QRadar, and I would say, I saw a suspicious interaction between this party and this party. They would actually be able to pull down and isolate those two particular entities, their interaction. Did my machine actually reach out to a malicious entity in, you know, say, Eastern Europe? Okay. They actually can confirm the fact that we did reach out to it, and it shows us what the exploit was using QRadar that they were trying to exploit, which is that particular CVE associated with Google Chrome. Based on that, I can take big fix and I can say I know specifically what they're trying to exploit right now because when they fish, when they try to fish you, they're usually trying to fish the entire organization. I mean, I like to feel special, I really do. But usually they're hitting a couple of hundred machines in your enterprise at the same time. They're hitting all your different email addresses. They have lists of hundreds of thousands of email addresses they're hitting all the time. Okay? So it's important that you identify what they're, what's, what they're trying to exploit, and then with Big Fix, we can actually patch that in one shot. So Fish Fry, I'm actually looking at what's going on. QRadar, I'm actually reaching out to the edge and confirming my suspicion that there's been a malicious interaction. And then Big Fix actually enables me to do something about it in one shot. So as we mentioned earlier going into this, talking about the single pane of glass. If you look at the way fish fry is put together, fish fry, uh, not the prettiest thing in the world, but it was focus groups sitting down with analysts who do this every day. How do they do their business and how can, we, what's the data that we can pull together to give them more valuable uh, insight into what's going on? So looking at fish fry, you're looking at 15 different data feeds are pulled together and correlated just to provide analysts with that view. Visualization is key. Uh, human mind interprets data 10,000 times faster visually than they do textually. I see so many of these spreadsheet systems. And uh, that's, you know, spreadsheets are good for a couple of hours. Uh, 14 hours in a day, spreadsheets not as good. Uh, don't don't kind of keep that, uh, that, that kind of loses its luster over time. And then the resources. Right now, we prioritize everything, we score all the different threats that are coming through the system, and we prioritize it back to the analysts. Rather than them having to figure out what is important, what's not important, we actually score it based on weighting factors that they provide and present it to them in a queue that they can work with. When I talked about 13 different systems look up an IP address, that's a national embarrassment. Um, we triage everything about it. When, when you get something from the analytics that we run, You've got the who is data, you've got the reverse DNS, you've got all of that, that's all done before I put it in front of you. Because when I put it in front of that analyst, which is relatively rare, I have to make it actionable. And then key, the, the false positive mitigation. Taking non-actionable events out of the queue, 35 to 50% reduction in non-actionable events. Which, if you take those and you push those aside, uh, workload becomes manageable. Bruce, do you want to kind of take it home? Or well, sure. So it's just questions. Or? If you have any questions, please come up and talk to us later on. Uh, there's our points of contact as well. Uh, we have two partners. Uh, obviously, Wayne mentioned R2I, and then also some machine learning activity and integration from a company called Clear Avenue. 
These are, again, people who are subject matter experts. IBM is great at building tools, right? So if, if you think of the Home Depot as the IBM store, and there's all kind of wonderful power tools available for you to use, we're not the carpenters. We're not the builders, right? We have the great tools that the builders come to, like Wayne and Clear Avenue come to use the IBM tools to build a solution like this, right? Uh, so we need these partners, and they've been very successful. Uh, Wayne's being a little modest about what he's done in his past. Uh, DHS is one of the success stories of, of him and uh, some of the partners that his company have put together what DHS uses on a regular basis to defend uh, our networks. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions? Stunned in the silence. There we go. It's always hard after lunch. I'm glad we have a person awake in the back of the room. Thanks. Thank you very much. It was a good presentation. I'm wondering, I'm not a DHS. I'm a small agency. What's the business value for me? I can't afford all these things. Well, I mean, depending on what type of work, you know, I hear that on a regular basis from customers, especially in like the medical field. I mean, I don't know, uh, spending a uh, hundred grand to defend my network versus paying probably three or four million in HIPAA violations, you know, I like the hundred grand. You know what I mean? When you look at the value add, if you look at what's happening right now with like PII data loss and things of that nature, that is the trade-off right there. You have to show that you've done due diligence in protecting and defending the data. That's if you look at the lawsuits that happened after Home Depot and Target, um, there was a lot of thinking about well, why would I do this? If you don't want to lose your intellectual property because that's a lot of what they're after. And I got to tell you, I hear customers, I have a customer that I work with who's a firearms manufacturer. And they're like, why would anybody want my data? And yet we find foreign actors running around their network trying to scoop up patent related information, process related information. They're mining all of that. That intellectual property that you work for they're taking. Okay, I have a follow-on question. Good. This is great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Every agency that you go, or most of the companies that you have dealt with have their firewalls. Yes, sir. They have their IDSs. Yes. Okay. Uh, they have, they're scanning their um, email traffic. I mean, there are tools that are available out there in the marketplace. And then we also are doing patch and patch management mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Yes. All the tools, some of the tools we have, what I see is one plain and actionable decision. Mm -hmm. And I see all kinds of data. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Okay. But what is it that, I mean, we, we take these things to our senior leadership and they say, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. I have. Charts, more charts, so many, so many false attempt, so many places came yep. and tried to scan our network. Yep. We have all of them, okay? Mm -hmm. But from the senior leadership, they're thinking of, what do you want me to do? How do I know? Um, you know, they're looking for a single answer or a set of a small set of answers. So, so how do you show those business values to them? Thank you. I have to, thank you, I have to deal with that scenario right now because I have several different audiences. I have the security audience that I have to speak to and I have to speak about signatures and some of these other things. You bring up signatures. I'm not going to disparage signatures, but if you look at it, signatures are one facet of a, a full you know, portfolio of capability required to defend your network. If you look at Lockheed, and you look at you know, these kind of advanced attack techniques, and, and keep in mind, I mean, Lockheed's not a state actor. Lockheed, you're talking about somebody manufactured this thing, and they're manufacturing many variants of it that are being sent against customers. The way we have to combat what you're talking about is my community, and I'm speaking primarily about me, traditionally we have not done a good job of speaking to the C-suite. CFO, CTO, EIEIO, we have not talked to them very effectively about what are we doing. How do, you know, I, I have had a CEO look at me and say, 
how the hell do I know you're doing your job right? And I mean, you really have to kind of stick, take a step back. Well, I blocked this and I blocked that. Well, what were they attacking? What was the value of what they were after? Is it worth it? So we've gotten to a point where we are now messaging on multiple levels. That's one of the things about fish fry is when we're blocking, we're actually pushing a view back up to the C-suite that shows how much we're blocking, how much we're intercepting, how much we're uh, evaluating, um, and how much we're denying access to their, their network. So all of that's integrated. And the C-suite, instead of us briefing them in, you know, like this after lunch, a really rough session, um, <laughs> we're going in and actually being able to show them things in the security operations center that speak to them. You know, I have a Fortune 50 client that I've got to go see next week. And if the C-suite walks into, you know, the CEO, any of the leadership, if they walk into that sock and they don't understand what's going on, we're hamburger. We have to sell a story to them like we have to sell to everybody else. When we talk about single panes of glass, it's aligned along what I showed with, like, the pure data. We have a net ops view, network operations. We have a security operations view. And then we have a C view. So the, the C-suite view is primarily toward threat intelligence. And what it shows them is what is actually being done on their network right now. In, in your particular case with what you were talking about, that hospital got hit for $17,000. That was one shot. If you're a health network, you may get hit 20 times in one day by that same kind of ransomware. So $17,000 times five, not fun. That's, that's a day. So CEOs, CFOs, and CTOs are becoming a lot smarter and a lot more malleable to different types of solutions. Does that add value? Okay. Does that address it, sir? Uh, thank you. Yes, sir. No, I, I, no, I appreciate it. I just want to make sure. Yes, sir. In the back. The microphone. Thanks. Uh, I had a comment and, and, and then a question. So as, as far as uh, looking at the, the cost uh, for Hollywood Memorial in California, uh, they, they now are subject to a $25,000 fine per patient yeah. uh, for, for the records that were accessed, multiplied that by thousands of patients, and you, you get the idea of the kind of fine that they're looking at from the state of California. So that's part of the risk uh, yeah. that if you don't, if you don't defend uh, the data. So my question has to do with uh, the uh, state-sponsored uh, attacks, which uh, received a lot of uh, has received a lot of press play, uh, mainly coming coming from China. And I was just curious if if you're still seeing that kind of activity, or has it, uh, it, it has it moved to another another location? The the. Um the Chinese sweep our networks like a Polish drive through I mean, they, uh, you know, so when you say the Chinese, and I, I'm gonna try to be politically correct here, um, or when you're dealing with the Chinese. Yes, yeah. Well, in, in, the, in the case of the Chinese, state-sponsored is kind of a murky issue because you have the empath, and the empath have their capability, and then you have the five tongs that align with the empath. So there's a plausible deniability built into that structure that says, oh, well, we didn't do it. Uh, those guys over there did it. It's kind of a 1930s um, Al Capone model in Chicago, uh, but it is very effective. The way, and this, is, this represents my opinion, and this does not represent the opinion of any of my clients. When you see, the, the way that I can see something and say it's primarily state-sponsored is the subject matter that they're after. If they're after uh, patent-related information, process-related information, baseline-related information, architecture, any of that stuff, usually that is going to be a state-sponsored entity or some entity chartered by a state-sponsored to do it. Because sometimes you'll see things are being targeted on a network, and you're like, okay, who would be behind? It's, it's coming out of Italy, you know, a geolocation. We, we could have another two-hour session about geolocation it would probably have to be a, a rated R over 14 kind of room to, to talk about that. 
Um, a lot of the time you'll hear, why are the Italians trying to get my process information? Well, because it's not the Italians, it's somebody coming through that IP address. You know, I, I understand the trickery associated with there. What we try to show our customers is more of the intent. What is the driver behind? What are they targeting on my network? Um, they're looking for databases. They're looking for repositories of files. They're trying to find key figures within the organization because either A, they want to steal the data from them, like the CFO, they want his financial record, uh, or they want to blackmail it. So they want to steal some of the stuff off their, their computer and ransom it back to them. So that's kind of common. Um, State-sponsored versus non-state actors, it's, it's a much more complicated, you know, it used to just be the you know, Russian Business Network and a couple of other entities that you had to deal with. Uh, it's a big, ugly world out there, getting bigger every day. And um, it's not easy to identify and separate. Usually with us, we can look at specifically what were they after on the network. Are they doing exploration? Or are they actually in trying to instrument things on the inside of the network? Does that answer, sir? Yes, sir. My question about uh, security, like everybody's main position is support the cloud-based environment. Mm -hmm. So security, if it's going to make things, or if it's actually make it more difficult for you or easier for you, what would you call it? I'm sorry, would you mind just repeating that in the microphone? Mm -hmm. Cloud-based uh, environments and security, better, worse, different? Cloud done right is a work of art. Cloud done wrong, not so good. Uh, it's more of a carnival thing. Um, when you look at uh, the cloud environment, if you isolate, it depends on what kind of service infrastructure you're pushing out onto the cloud. If you have repositories and you fortify the gateway, if you do it right, and you take, say, your repositories and you isolate them on one part of the cloud, and you really scrutinize the, lo scrutinize the logs, SSL everything, review the audits, you'll actually get finer ac grain access control than you would on a regular network. Um, the problem is not many people are doing that. Uh, a lot of them are moving out into a cloud environment and basically it's just taking their corporate infrastructure and throwing it out on the cloud. Um, the cloud can present some complexity because of the abstraction under the covers of the cloud infrastructure. Um, you'll, you'll have that kind of That'll serve as some backscatter. That creates some noise when you're running analytics. Uh, there have also been instances, and this represents my opinion. This doesn't represent the opinion of any of my clients. There have been instances where in the cloud, the DNS servers associated with the cloud have been manipulated or seeded or changed or, you know what I mean? You, I have seen instances where there's some messing around with the DNS infrastructure on the cloud going on. And I can route thing if I can get inside of your cloud environment, I can route things around without you knowing it. Because that's, that's the beauty of the cloud. It's all abstracted away. I don't see the ugliness under the covers. Yeah, that's a good and a bad. Um, a lot of what's going on behind the scenes, something really bad, you know, if you look at um, Operation Ghost Click two years ago, DNS changer, the DNS poisoning, DNS changer, it was three Estonians that were, uh, went to jail. Um, that was uh, that was a case where DNS was altered. Yes, sir. So we're just running out of time. We just want to thank you all for your attendance and the questions. If, but we do have some more questions. Please come on up. We'll be happy here to talk to you right here by the exit door. Uh, we'll get ready for the next session. Right. Thanks so much for your time.